Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Enjoy the Life You're Living. I'm your host, Jana Rieger, and today my guest is Ryan Riley. Ryan is a food writer, and he's founder of a cookery initiative in the UK called Life Kitchen. He's dedicated his life to creating delicious food for those living with cancer, and he's just an inspirational human being. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Hi, everyone. It's Jana Rieger here with another episode of Enjoy the Life You're Living. And I'm really excited today to introduce you to our guest, Ryan Riley, uh, chef extraordinaire with a special twist uh, that we're going to get into today to talk a little bit about how what he's been doing in his life relates to cancer and entrepreneurship. So Ryan, so great to have you here today. I just really want to dive into this conversation with you and um, welcome you to the show. Thank you. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and I'm really excited to talk about my, myself. Go on, <laughs> Isn't it great when we get to talk about ourselves? Um, Ryan, I think um, the perfect way to start this would be if you'd share with our listeners a bit about your backstory, um, the journey of how you got to um, be involved with or run Life Kitchen, the the um, cookbooks and everything. Um, so yeah, I would love to hear some of that. Yeah, so basically I'm Ryan Riley. I'm 29 now, but when I was 18 years old, my mother was diagnosed with small cell lung cancer. And during that time, I became her primary carer. And for me, I was really closer to her than the rest of my family because they had to work and they were at university. And it was kind of a lot of just me and my mother in the house. And I kept seeing all of the side effects she was going through from the treatment. It was a really harsh chemo and radiotherapy. And for her, it was not so much losing her hair or her eyebrows. It was losing her sense of taste that really got her down. Mm. You know, we were going out trying to make all these last memories, you know, at, at restaurants and things. And she couldn't taste the food. And that became a really pivotal thing for her. Like she was disconnected mm. from every moment where we were trying to make what we knew would be last memories. Mm. And... She, for the last sort of year of her life, she was kind of eating ice pops, like cold ice lollies for the sugary cold hit. It was the only pleasure she could get. And it, that kind of played on my mind that there was nothing I could do about her losing her hair. There's nothing I could do about losing her eyebrows or the, the treatment itself. But when she died, I was 20 and I I was constantly thinking for a few years after that, up until I was 24, about her experiences. And during that time, I'd become a food writer totally by accident never cooked before in my life I just accidentally fell into food writing and I worked with some of the most prestigious magazines in Britain and that gave me this kind of grounding in food knowledge and I yeah. took that knowledge really and I had this idea of what my mother was going through and I thought now I can cook so surely I can solve it I mean that's a level of audacity that I had at the time <laughs> and we just used that kind of passion in me just to to kind of set off along this path that now ended up being my nonprofit life kitchen. And it all started, and it is not a, it's not a very professional story, but it all started from when I was drunk and I tweeted saying I wanted to do a cookery class for people living with cancer. Yeah. It was, I suppose, it gave me the confidence to kind of say it. Mm. And it went semi-viral online. And mm. I basically was invited on one of the biggest radio shows in Britain to 10 million people to launch this idea of Life Kitchen. Mm. And all I was that people were suffering from taste loss I could cook how can we marry the two together mm. so I came off air at this radio four which is one of the biggest radio stations in Britain and I had a million offers of help including you know from scientists mm. and from cookery schools and celebrities and mm. I was like wow this is a real issue not just of my mother but lots of people yeah so I kind of set out on this journey to figure out some way to help cancer patients enjoy food again and that's really been our mission now for five years yeah yeah um can we talk a little bit more about your your mom's journey um and so when I think when people hear about you know someone has cancer it's like okay they hear that that kind of like the outer layer of that the, the top the top level yeah they hear cancer they hear oh what's the treatment are you going to survive and that's about yeah. it yeah and never really um, maybe understand what's going on in the background unless you're living it. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you talked about your mom and how she lost this enjoyment for food. And can you talk a little bit uh, more about that? Like, what does that do 
for, for someone who's never thought about that, you can't eat, you can't enjoy food. What does that do to someone's life and well-being? It, I can answer that so easily because it isolates them. It mm -hmm. really takes them out of being present. You know, I was saying before we went to these restaurants to try and make those memories. She was sitting at the table, but she wasn't at the table at all, really. Mm -hmm. She was just there physically, but not mentally. She wasn't present. Um, with a lot of my guests, and we've taught tens of thousands of people at Life Kitchen now, but with my guests, a lot of it is the um, psychological side. So once they stop eating, getting them back into the idea of eating is really difficult. And mm -hmm. that can then lead to eating disorders and it can lead to depression, all things that are really terrible. But what people don't understand is in this space of cancer, once you're through, once you're having treatment, people only think about surviving. Mm. But surviving it means way more than just living it means enjoying the life that you're part of it means eating it means socializing and friendships and all these wonderful things that we take for granted every single day mm -hmm. and cancer can strip all of that and can also strip the understanding from so many other people you know like exactly what you were saying like there are people who have come to my classes who are like i'm only here because my wife has made me come and and I just don't think it's very important. And then they taste something again. And they're like, oh, really, actually, food is important to my life. And I'd forgotten that. Or, you know, I'd never really registered because I'm living the trauma of living with cancer. Yeah. And there's so many parts that food can, can play in our lives that are, is far more important than just the nourishment it gives us. Yeah, yeah. And until you've been through something like that, it's hard to understand that, I think. And you said Excuse something. Me. Yeah, you said something interesting about it's hard for people to get back into it um, once they've been out and that there's this downstream effect of potential eating disorders and that type of thing. What do you think is, what's that block there of like hopping back into it? For a, it's actually a really multifaceted answer because for a lot of people, it is, they were eating their favorite food still during treatment. So now they feel sick when they think about that. It's, it's food uh -huh. memory, so it links them back to it. So they get scared that now every time I'm going to eat psychologically, I'm going to feel sick, which is terrifying because feeling sick is one of the worst feelings we feel. And yeah. yet we still continue to live with it every day. There's also a lot of the people, especially with what you guys do with swallowing difficulties. Some people need a certain type of thickness or a certain type of um, you know, amount of food that they can eat. We see a lot of people with stomach cancers, so they can eat very, very reduced amounts and they are desperate to eat, but that scares them. And mm. it can be, it's a lot of fear, a fear around food that many of us would never even think is a thing. Yeah. It becomes a real thing. And if you think about how many times we eat a day, three meals, a bunch of snacks, you know, whatever you do, that is multiple amounts of times you put your hand to your mouth. And that psychologically can connect back to all of those times that they used to eat. And it mm. just becomes an absolute big mess of problems. Mm. Um, a lot of our guests don't want to eat anymore because it doesn't taste of anything. So why would I bother to eat? My nan mm. is a perfect example. She had bowel cancer recently. She's got a stoma bag now. She resents the stoma bag. So the idea of eating mm. and filling the bag, it's just all, all of that for her. Like she can't even talk about it. Hmm. and th those things you know can, can be can go on a million different ways for many different people yeah. and the idea of eating just becomes very very low on the priority list and yeah. I think for, for a lot of people that's that can become their life and, and if you don't have anyone else around you with those issues you can feel like it's just you it's not that important I'm still alive but hmm. actually far more complex than that Mm hmm. Absolutely. I know, you know, we had heard um, when I was working in the clinic, patients would say, if I knew that I had to live with this problem, I wouldn't have had the cancer treatment. I, I mean, this has affected my life so much that I would I'd rather not have done it. Um, yeah, my name, she said, I'd rather not be here right now than living the way I am. And I guess that is incredibly sad. But also, you have to really respect that for them, because. Mm -hmm. Food is way more than just the, the stuff we put in our body. It is, for most people, their social life. It is their family time. It yeah. is, you know, time with their partners. And when you take that away, life really diminishes to, to a very low level of what actually you've got that's left that is enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. So also on, on this, um, another aspect that people never think of, and, and in fact, 
you brought this to the forefront of my mind when I was looking at um, your cookbook, Essential Flavor, which we'll talk a bit more about in just a second, but the economic impact of cancer. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so we've written a bunch of books now. My first one, Life Kitchen, I wrote um, because I was cooking all these cookery classes and I didn't really have anything to give anyone. So we thought, let's write a book for that. That did really, really well. Um, but that was at a different time. That was I wrote that three years ago. The world was a different place three years ago than it is now. Yeah. So we did a bunch of stuff for COVID taste loss during the time. But then very recently, we'd heard so much about the cost of living crisis, which is just hitting everyone and especially cancer patients. Um, I'm an ambassador for Maggie's, the cancer centres in the UK. And we did a survey where 55% of respondents were choosing between heating their homes and eating because it was so expensive to live. And I just thought, how can I stand on my moral high ground and look at all these lovely recipes if I don't give out a resource that addresses the budgetary issues that they're facing? And for me, it was just a very much a thing about we, it's not that I want to do this book. We have to do this book because people need it. Yeah. So we made a small recipe book. We gave it away for free. It's been a massive success as as, as everything Life Kitchen's done somehow is. Um, very proud of all of it. But um, the <laughs> recipes were very simple. But it was about using hacks where we could. Um, but also making sure we had three key ingredients in there. And one of them is miso paste. Um, miso is something that we use a lot in Life Kitchen. Mm. And it, it has an underlying scientific reason of that everything that we eat is is based on our taste buds. So sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Now, not many people know what umami is, but it mm -hmm. is just translates to savoriness. It's our fifth taste receptor. And it's that depth that you get from mushrooms or parmesan or miso, that real savoriness that we all enjoy. And I just thought by adding that savoriness to the undertone of every recipe, we could ensure that we, we kind of gave the palate a little bit of a chance to kind of get the flavour in. I'll explain more about that later on because I know you've probably got a question about it. But basically, yeah. Essential Flavour was designed to be this sort of guide to quick flavour as cheap as possible. Yeah. And I think, you know, what was really nice about it, when you look at the recipes in there, they're super healthy. They're inexpensive. I, I never ever set out to do health as, as a key because yeah. people always look at, cancer and say oh cut out sugar cut out this <laughs> actually no if you're not eating and all you want to eat is sugar then go ahead you know it's about you know you can't deprive someone of maybe the only thing they're going to eat yeah and my mother with her ice pops she was going to die anyway do you think she really cared about whether there was sugar in it you know and no not at all life kitchen for me was about these recipes that were delicious and sometimes accidentally healthy. I'm glad that they come out that way. But there's, <laughs> it's about variation and it's about eating and it's about the desire to eat, I guess. That's what's at the core of Life Kitchen's principles is yeah. bringing back that enjoyment in food. And however that looks to somebody is completely fine. Yeah, yeah. So now we've talked a little bit about Life Kitchen, um, but um, I'm sure listeners are wondering, okay, what is this? What is Life Kitchen? So can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so basically Life Kitchen is a set of cookery classes and a cookery school and a recipe um, kind of company. And basically what we do is we're a non-profit. We do free cookery classes for people living with cancer all over the UK, sometimes in Europe and hopefully soon in Canada. Awesome. Um, we're going to be basically, what we do is we bring in the sort of person living with cancer and their friend or carer, and they just spend the day learning my recipes, cooking and half of it is about bringing together a community of people in the same room. Mm. A lot of people say to me all the time, Life Kitchen works because it's barely about cancer at all. It's about bringing people together and they yeah. feel in their own time that they can open up and they can say what they want to say. They yeah. can share what they want to share. And they realize they're not alone. Mm. Back to that point of isolation from earlier. They realize that actually it's not just me, it's Sandra as well. It's Jim as well. It's Barry as well. You know, all these people around them. And suddenly, I guess when you realize that you're not the only one who is mm. suffering, way, it becomes the burden becomes a bit easier, even just mentally, you know, understanding yeah. that not just you. So Life Kitchen has the cookery classes. We have two cookery schools, one in London and one in the northeast of England, where I'm from. And we do recipes. So we have Life Kitchen's debut book, which is called Life Kitchen. I believe you can get it all across the world on Amazon. Um, we wrote a book called Taste and Flavor, which was for COVID taste loss. 
Mm. And we actually are the world experts at what we do. So when it happened, when COVID happened, people kept coming to us being like, can you help with the taste loss side? Turns out we could because we had access to some of the biggest science papers. And it's actually the two year anniversary today of Taste and Flavor. And that blew up across the world. Yeah. And we gave that free as well. Um, we do a lot of stuff for free because me, when I was growing up, my mother and father didn't have much money. Mm. And um, food is quite elitist at times. Mm. Well, mm-hmm. Good food is reserved for people with money. And that just shouldn't be how it is. And cancer takes away a lot of people's sources of money, their transfer income. So I wanted to make sure that everything we did was affordable, was free in wherever I could make it but never compromised on the reason that we started it, which was to help people enjoy food again. Yeah. Now you said something really interesting around accidental success, (laughs) which I'm not sure success is ever accidental, but I think some things that lead up to it are, and just reading a bit about your, your story and the background and what you said, you know, when you started, you had no, like really no chef knowledge. Um, You just fell into this. Um, but there was also, I'd read something about a lottery ticket. And I'm a wondering- casino <laughs> It was a oh, casino it was a win. Oh, a casino win. That's what it was. Would you mind telling us that story? Yeah. Um, it, was a, it was a really sad story, to be honest, cause because my mother had died three weeks before. Mm. My friend came to my house and said, you, you're in the house too much. You need to come out. Let's have a night out. Let's get your mind off it and just start living again. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And she said, let's go to the casino. And I only had 20 pounds on me at the time. And I didn't want to ask my dad. He just lost his wife. And I just only had this small amount of money. But I was like, fine, we'll go to the casino. If we win, we'll go out. And I expected to win 20, 30 more pounds for a couple of drinks in a bar. Um, And I sat down at a blackjack table. I had played a bit in the past. I wasn't a gambler. But, you know, like some, you go to a casino occasionally on a night out or something. And I put down this bet and it had this opportunity to buy into the jackpot. And the jackpot was one pounds to buy into it. And the jackpot was 28,000. And you had to get four aces of the same color and the same suit. So four ace of spades, for example. And I got two ace of spades and that meant the jackpot had 100 pounds. I was delighted. I was like, that's great. There's money for a night out. And yeah. the dealer said to me, would you like to split them for the chance to win the big jackpot? And I was like, you know what? I didn't have it before. Let's do it now. And I got it again. Two ace of spades again. Four ace of spades in a row with six players and six decks. Apparently the odds are like 1.3 mi- one in one three million or something. And the dealer looked at me and said, you've won. And I was like, what do you mean I've won? And he was like, <laughs> the jackpot. <laughs> and I walked away from that day with £28,000 richer. And it was insane. And with that money, I went back to Kimberly, who's my co-founder at Life Kitchen. She's my best friend. She lost her mother to cancer too. And both of us said, what should we do with this money? Should we move to London? So we packed up, we flew to Barcelona, went on holiday, flew back into London, paid my rent up front for a year. And that gave us a year in London just to figure out who we were. Mm. Because we were both 22 old kids who'd lost a parent, cancer had dominated our lives. We had no idea where we were going and we had a bit of cash. I mean, it was the best situation that could have came out of what was the worst situation of my life. And undeniably, that set me on a path to where we are today. And it's it's an extraordinary thing. One that will never happen again, I'm sure. Yeah. I just love the story. Yeah, for sure. And then from there, I read, um, I believe it was Camden Market. You guys started a booth. Um, a food booth is that right yeah. yeah again with no experience we opened up a food stall um every Sunday we were teaching ourselves to cook from a Jamie Oliver cookbook um, and it was just as simple as that and we never made any money at Camden but what it made was it made us have this appreciation of food we were around all these different cultures you know there was an Indian stall next to us and Thai people you know the other stall and they, they would talk to us and feed us and It just kind of showed me all the different flavors from around the world. It was an extraordinary food education and I loved it. And when we left Camden, because they were closing the part that we were in down and it was becoming very posh at the time, you know, gentrification. And I, that was when I applied to the food magazines. I was like, I love food now. I've got this idea of food. 
And I applied to a magazine called Sainsbury's Magazine by the big supermarket in the UK. And this woman called Mitzi Wilson, she was the former editor-in-chief of Delicious Magazine and BBC Good Food, two of the biggest in Britain. And she was at Sainsbury's at the time and she took this chance on me. And she said, I like you, come work for me and I see, yeah. we'll see what you can do. And I spent six months at Sainsbury's and it absolutely changed my life. It gave me a food education that I never could have afforded. Yeah. And it just taught me all about, you know, writing recipes and editorial side and making things beautiful. And there are things that I've carried across the Life Kitchen and have really kind of made the brand what it is today. Yeah. And the people I met when I was at those, that magazine, the celebrities and all the things the kind of people who I'm now friends with and who very much I've forced into backing Life Kitchen. So it's yeah. been really it's really, really beneficial in all in so many ways. Yeah, for sure. And such a journey. And really, um, in many ways, you maybe you never meant to set out on an entrepreneurial journey, but you definitely did. Um, and um, you know, a lot of people who are interested in in this particular show are entrepreneurs. And so I'm wondering if you can say something about um maybe the ups the ups of that journey and and some of the challenges of that journey like what's been amazing and and what have been the things that are challenging in in that journey um, definitely so the amazing things are is if you just go ask people they're more than willing to help nearly always wow. you know I've always said my greatest strength is that I'm unafraid to ask for what I want hmm. and whether so, you know whether that's an email to ask for someone to do something work with us or collaborate with us or even if it's just to have that confidence in myself to get up every day and back my own idea. Hmm. You know, I, I, I was thinking about this cookery class of Life Kitchen for years before I even launched it. Hmm. But I didn't know what form it was going to take. And I think my biggest bit of advice is to let that idea ruminate, really hmm. figure out. Don't worry about figuring it out. It will figure itself out in whatever hmm. capacity it eventually pours out of you in. Um, And the biggest downfalls have really been maintaining finance in so many ways so we've done loads of projects and we're a non-profit so I never really seek to make money but we but making money keeps the business going of course. and quite often we we work with other brands and organizations and we do stuff for them and maybe it's a 20 grand deal and you get wrapped up in that 20 grand deal and you should never forget that you need another 20 grand deal before that one's even finished to make sure <laughs> yeah. you continue to go that's been a hard thing for us you know it's very much like we, we throw ourselves into a project, we get to the end and we're like, oh, bloody hell, we haven't got the next project lined up. <laughs> so that was the biggest learning curve for me. Something that I had to ensure that, you know, my staff would be paid at the end of the month and that we had something to pay them from. So yeah. that, was, that was a long, long, long learning curve and still something we're trying to get right. But also, if you believe in what you do, other people will believe in what you do. Yeah. And it is just about giving yourself that little bit of, tiny celebration every time you achieve something I always try to do something for myself I go out with Kim and we have a little meal or a drink or just something because yeah. I think there were a million people who could do what I do but I've had a, some luck and some chances and some opportunities that some people never will yeah. and you could never forget how great how you know how grateful you have to be for that yeah that there were a million people out there who could do just a, as good of a job and I never to forget you never forget to be grateful. That's what I'm trying to say. Hundred percent. I love that, Ryan. Um, so on that note, and on like that's like typical startup route. Um, how how can the listeners get involved and support what you're doing? Um, well, we have a load of resources at lifekitchen.co.uk. Um, people can kind of buy the Life Kitchen book from Amazon. You can donate to us. You can kind of even just share our stuff online. Um, our biggest mission is just about reaching people. Uh, yeah. You know, the COVID book did 2.8 billion media hits globally over the two years. Wow. Which is a lot. I was a cover of the Washington Post and I was syndicated on every small TV show in America, like Fox in every state and all these yeah. crazy things. And I launched um the, my COVID book on CTV in Canada before I launched it on anywhere else. And yeah, I think. We're just all about reaching people because, again, it goes back to what we said in the beginning, isolation and yeah. people not knowing that there's these resources out there. So I guess the biggest way anyone can ever help us is sharing what we do. Yeah. But also, we're really keen to go back on tour. So I want to bring Life Kitchen all around the world and do pop-up cookery classes. So if there's ever any 
of that over your side of things, we'd love to come help. Oh, hundred percent. We'll make sure it happens, Ryan, <laughs> uh, for sure. And, you know, um, just for the listeners, there are a lot of free resources that you have. And in fact, um, the Essential Flavor Cookbook is a free download as far as um, if, yeah. if you want to do that. Flavor is free to download. Um, Taste and Flavor is free to download. We've got two others with the World Cancer Research Fund um, called Flavor and Nutrition. I can't remember the name of the other one. There's been so many. Um, <laughs> and you can get um, those at lifekitchen.co.uk and at the World Cancer Research Fund website. So they're all out there. They are completely everyone's to use. Feel free to use them, translate them, put them anywhere. Yeah. Food is, like I said earlier, it shouldn't be elitist and neither should the recipes. Of course, yeah. our main Life Kitchen book, someone had to pay yeah. for it. So Bloomsbury, my publisher, has paid for it. So you do Fantastic. buy that one if you want to, if you really want to support. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, talking about um, the creation of recipes and, and the food that you make, how do you get inspired to create recipes? It's difficult. Right here in my hand, I'm holding <laughs> my new book, which is out next year. Um, and this has been a year of just constant trauma to me, basically, because trying to figure out new recipes that fell within our criteria that were delicious, but also affordable. Yeah. That is a difficult thing. And also, you don't uh, you don't want to be reinvent the wheel too much because people yeah. who are living with cancer you want them to enjoy the things they know but with a little bit of a twist so recipe development for us is definitely the hardest part it's something yeah. that we do with constantly every single day um we've just written 100 recipes for my new book but we, we started with four or five hundred ideas yeah and wow. get them down so it is, is a very very difficult process and something that we're very very good at now yeah. but it doesn't get easier every time we start a new project I look at the page and I'm like no clue what we're going to do on this one and then suddenly you know once you get over, it's like anything in entrepreneurship once you get over that first little hill yeah of that first idea or even that first page that might be complete rubbish once you've written it you yeah. get into a little bit of a flow we have this joke in Life Kitchen that when we start recipe development even the first day is either amazing and we get like 10 brilliant ideas down or it's terrible and nothing works <laughs> Yeah. And it's there's no in between. It's either one or the other. Yeah. We try not to let that get to us. You know, it's food is we have to remember at the end of the day, it's just food. It's yeah. just food. It's not that important. We can make beautiful food, whether it's today or tomorrow, and one idea will work. And you just build upon that. You can't let yourself get too overwhelmed. Yeah. And so sure. our recipe process really often starts with looking at our favorite foods yeah. or classic dishes and how can we add a twist to them and then it gets more and more inventive from there and then it goes off on a tangent usually <laughs> sounds like a lot of fun um and just zeroing in a little bit more to um a population of of pe uh, people who have cancer which is head and neck cancer um mm. can you talk a little bit more about some of the special considerations that you you look at when you're thinking about recipes for folks who have head and neck cancer yeah it, this is one of the extremely difficult parts of life kitchen um tell a funny story about the first time i ever did anything with head and neck cancer patients um i was in a hospital and i was being filmed for the news and i'd never done anything with head and neck cancer patients before so the first class i ever did with them i was being filmed for the national news in a hospital with a load of nurses and doctors and I talk about throwing it myself in, in the deep and and it was a struggle and it continues to be a struggle it's actually the hardest part about life kitchen is you know most people can eat something normally yeah. with head and neck cancer, we're always looking at different thicknesses different viscosities of things you know that people can swallow and or we're looking at um, people often tasting things and very quickly having to drink something after mm -hmm. and obviously can mess up the taste buds and the way that you do it so for us it's been a very difficult journey and still one that we're learning a lot on but my biggest takeaway from all of the recipes that we've done in this space has been all about the thickness mm. a lot of people with swallowing difficulties if, I, um, if it's not the right thickness it can be really dangerous for them so yeah. for, for us that's been a learning curve for yeah, sure yeah and just thinking about you know um at one time 
people were told, well, you know, throw everything in the, throw your meal in the blender. And it yeah. turns into and how did it get that down? I mean, come on. So, so can you talk a little bit about sight and how, how what you're looking at on your plate relates to the pleasure of eating? Yeah, well, actually, there's a few different ways that we do things in our kitchen. And one of them is visually how we how we do it. So it's about goes back to when I was working at the magazines and I became a food stylist. So a food stylist makes things look pretty for TV or magazines. And and it just really brought to the forefront how important color is. So even if you're having a soup and it's say a pea soup, so it's green. So you blend that up, just giving it a little drizzle on top with cream or creme fraiche or or yogurt and then just adding some seeds or just something that just creates a bit of visual interest. And we, we, we kind of started on that point when we were looking at recipes like that. But then we thought more about how we use the science of it. And mm. we looked at the trigeminal nerve, which is the nerve you have between your eyes, nose and your mouth. And it's the nerve that often burns in the bridge of your nose when you have too much toothpaste or mm. wasabi or mustard. Mm. And we thought about how interesting it is that even if you're struggling with flavor, if you put lots of mustard in something, you get sensation. So mm. psychologically, when you're eating it, yes, your nose is burning, but you're feeling something from mm. the food. You're connected to that dish. Mm -hmm. So important as visuals became to us, we thought how important sensation is too. Mm. So then we mm. kind of went the lines of getting people to add that little bit extra horseradish into their dish. So yes, their, no their nose just gives a little tingle. And mm. you, you'd, you'd kind of be amazed at how much just that little bit of a psychological connection to food reignite something back in people you know gives them that little idea of maybe it's not all over for me in food maybe I can have some pleasure yeah. and don't forget just because it's a little burning thing we love burning from chili we love burning you know we become addicted to those things and yeah. and that we use in life kitchen to bring people back around to the psychological way of eating and I think that's a really special thing that not many people have ever done before yeah and and then also hot and cold. We mm. often really tell people, like, we have this recipe in Life Kitchen, which is called miso white chocolate. So it's a hot white chocolate sauce with miso mm. in it. So it's sweet and it's savory. Mm. And then we serve it over frozen berries. Mm. So it's hot and cold. So they bite into the berry and it's freezing. Yeah. Um, but then the hot sauce is there too. And again, that's just about, you know, connecting them and making it interesting. Because yeah. food doesn't have to be boring. Um, yeah. you know lost the sense of taste or, or if you're struggling in other ways yeah. just kind of creating it's about creating new ways to eat I guess yeah yeah for sure uh this has been just an amazing conversation Ryan and um one of the things that I love to ask all of my guests is um what the phrase enjoy the life you're living means to you and you already kind of said it <laughs> but <laughs> I'm just going to ask it again um so personally what does that phrase mean to you to me, it means enjoy the life you're living really means connecting with people and being present in the moment. I guess that's kind of been my biggest thing. Mm. I've always felt like when I lost my mother, I realized life is short. She was a very careful woman. Mm. She had spreadsheets for finances and only mm. did certain things. And, mm. you know, she died, you know. So mm. I think for me, it was about finding my purpose and my passion with like minded people. And it's about eating. I love eating. I love food. And that it's never too late to step up to something. I didn't publish my first recipe till I was 25. I'm 29 now with like how many books and, you know, a, yeah. a, a, a tag of a celebrity chef, which I never thought I would be classed as. Yeah. I'm, I'm a bad boy from a council estate, you know. Yeah. And for me, enjoying life and living is about being present, I guess, is, is the shortest word. And that phrase really resonates with Life Kitchen because our whole phrase is enjoying food again. And for a lot of people, enjoying food again is about enjoying the life that they're living and one that we hope that we can kind of give to them in whatever way that we can. Well, thank you, Ryan. It's been an amazing conversation. I wish you and all of the troop that you have around you just the, the best of luck and um, to continue on your journey because what you're doing is so important for so many people. Uh, so thank you for what you do. Thank you very, very much. And I hope to see you out where you are very soon. We will see you in Canada. <laughs> yeah. uh, We've got more subscribers in Canada than we have in Britain because of that one CCTV uh, one, one appearance. 
I'm going to reach out to them and maybe I'll do something on CCV very soon. Mm, fantastic. Sounds great, Ryan. Thank you.